A virgin having a child conceived by God? Impossible, you say. This week on Behold the Savior, we're going to see that with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The average adult makes 35,000 choices per day. Many of those decisions include a moral struggle. Every year, one out of every five people fall victim to a crime. We live in a lost and broken world full of distractions. But we all want something better. We're all searching for something. The world stands in desperate need of something. The need of a Savior. By beholding, we become changed. The miracle of birth is an absolutely astounding thing. Here you are at three days old. This is the 16 cells that will eventually become the 75 trillion cells that makes up you who you are. Here you are three days old, small enough to fit in the eye of a needle. Yet the 75 trillion cells that you will become, if you were to stack them one on top of the other, that would be enough to make it from Earth to the moon and back 178,000 times. The human body is absolutely miraculous. The most technologically advanced thing on planet Earth is the human eye. In fact, science has yet to be able to duplicate it with computers or lenses. In the womb, one million optic nerve endings left your eye and one million optic nerve endings left your brain to connect and they had to meet their exact match at the right time, at the right place. And in that instant when they connected, you had sight for the very first time. When this happened, you had one piece of skin covering the eye. And then miraculously, a, a cutting device appears and separates your eyes. You have eyelids and you can blink for the very first time inside your mother's womb. It is amazing the way that God has designed us. For birth to happen at all is absolutely astounding, but for birth to be the result of God through a virgin is another thing altogether. One of the most famous verses in the Bible at Christmas time is found in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So we hear of the virgin birth. We've seen it in the Bible, but what does it mean? What were the events surrounding this prophecy? Why was it given? Well, let's back up a little bit more in this passage of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 9. In the passage of Isaiah chapter 7, it tells us that war and utter destruction was on the horizon for King Ahaz. God was trying to direct and lead Ahaz, and he says this in chapter 7, verse 9, If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, trying to direct King Ahaz, and he even offered him a sign, a chance, a blank check. Verse 10 says, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or the height above. Now imagine if God asked you for a sign, and he said, You can ask anything of me. Uh, anything you can possibly imagine is a sign to prove that I am who I am and I know what I know. What would you do? Well, Ahaz doesn't take him up on this offer, and you have to wonder why. Is it a sense of humility, or is it a sense of appearing to be humble? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 12 says, But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. You see, Ahab, he wanted the help of Assyria for this battle, not the help of God. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 13, it says, Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Have you ever wondered if, we, if God ever gets tired of us asking him of things? Now here God says, ask anything you want, and it'll be given you, it'll be a sign. Actually, Jesus in the New Testament says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given to you. God asks us to go on faith in how he's led in the past. But here says, will you weary my God also? 
The beautiful thing about God is no matter what we ask, no matter what we come to him with, he doesn't get weary. He doesn't get tired of hearing our, our thoughts, our, our, even our complaints. He sits there, patiently listens. Verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Ahaz says, I don't want a sign. And God says, you know what? I'm going to give you a sign. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The prophecy was, you're going to go into battle. I'm going to win for you. And to prove that, a virgin will conceive and will bear a son. Now, this is a prophecy that stretched down generations. It may have actually had bearing at that time also, but this was a prophecy of the Messiah that would, be to, that would come in another 750 years. Stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to see what the Bible says about the virgin birth. Was it an actual virgin birth? And how do we explain the critical attacks on the Bible about it? This is a tablet. This is also a tablet. This did not evolve from this. This is an intelligent design. This is an intelligent design. This is an ape. This is a human. This did not evolve from this. This is an intelligent design. Any questions? Understanding creation and evolution in humanity. Welcome back to Behold the Savior. We've seen that there was a prophecy that a virgin would conceive and bear a child, and we know that there are critical attacks on this, but we want to see what good, responsible, thorough Bible study will turn up. The prophecy was in Isaiah chapter 7. Now we want to go to the New Testament, to Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, and see the prophecy. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. I remember when I was going over uh, a Christmas story at one point, and I was very new to learning and studying the Bible, and I was talking with a lady, and she said to me, you know that Jesus isn't God, don't you? And it was the first time that I had heard that to, to my face. And I was a little young, a little naive, and I wasn't sure how to answer. But God brought this verse back to my mind. We go back to Matthew 1.23, which says, His name shall be Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. The name Emmanuel means God with us. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then skip down to verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh. God chose to come, show us, teach us how to live, and bring us salvation by becoming human in flesh. The prophecy here says that it would come through a virgin. Now, this next statistic was surprising to me. There was a poll that was done on Christmas Day in 2013. It proved that 73% of Americans believe in the virgin birth. Now, this is not just 75% of Christians. This is 75% of Americans, irregardless of their religious affiliation or even non-religious affiliation. So when the media or the scientists try to push that most of the people do not believe in the virgin birth, that simply does not hold up to true facts. So let's continue. The Bible commentary says this, The critics point to the fact that pagans attributed the greatness of men such as Alexander, Alexander the Great, Pythagoras, the great mathematician, Plato, the great philosopher, and Augustus, to descend from gods and to supposed virgin birth. As surprising as it may be to many Christians, a virgin birth is not unique to Christianity. The true fact that it actually happened is unique to Christianity, but uh, history and mythology point to m these great men. They were so great that they were considered to be a descendant uh, of a god, even to the point of a virgin birth. Other Bible critics dispute the claim due to the lack of corroboration in the Gospels of Mark, John, and the Pauline epistles. So because Paul did not specifically say there was a virgin birth, they reasoned that it must not have happened. And because some of the gospel writers did not specifically say it then, it must not have happened. 
But the beautiful thing about the Bible, and particularly the, the Gospels, is they highlighted on certain aspects. They did not all highlight on every aspect. You have different points of view. And that actually gives more credibility to the Bible, because if all four Gospels said the exact same thing, then the critic would say then they corroborated together to come up with this story. The fact that they do not say the exact same thing actually lends credibility to the Bible. So then many critics reason, well, maybe the problem is in the wording of the word virgin. Let's take a look at it. The Old Testament, the word virgin comes from the Hebrew word alma, which means a marriageable age. So then they see, see the prophecy pointed to someone that wouldn't necessarily be a virgin, but it would be someone that is of a marriageable age. But the problem is in the New Testament, because the New Testament, the word virgin comes from the Greek word parthenos, which means virgin. So even linguistically, there's no way to escape that the Bible points to the fact that Mary was an actual virgin when she conceived. Not only that, but it's written right in the Bible story. The critics also claim that Jesus was the son of a Roman soldier, according to Celsus, the Egyptian philosopher, who may have been Christianity's first scholarly critic. Writing in the AD 100, Celsius said the soldier's name was Panthera, close to Parthenos. And here you would have to distort and twist the original wording in the Bible to make this theory fit. So they reason that maybe there was a soldier that raped or impregnated Mary, and then she had to come up with a story that she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit, and maybe, maybe that's what happened. Luke chapter 1 verse 34 says, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this happen? I am a virgin. Even Mary herself, as recorded by inspiration in the Bible, claimed that she was a virgin. Matthew chapter 1 verse 20 says about Joseph, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So for us to reason that Mary was not a virgin conceived of the Holy Spirit, you would have to either remove the scriptures altogether or twist it to fit the way that we want to. But what did it mean to Mary? It would not have been the easiest thing for her to say and, and claim that she was pregnant, became pregnant out of wedlock. There was a lot at stake here. What would this have meant to her? This would have meant that she was a social outcast. And notice in the Bible that you don't read much about Mary's parents. I don't know what that means exactly, but maybe there was social problems there. Uh, she would have been looked down on by friends, by family, by other leaders. Uh, it wouldn't have been a good situation. Mary also could have faced the possibility of a death penalty and in, in, in issues of adultery and other scenarios of illicit relationships, you could face being stoned to death. What about the impossible expectations this whole scenario would have placed on Mary? Can you imagine being a young lady and being told by an angel that you're going to become pregnant and you are gonna bear God? in human form, 100% God, 100% human. How would you react to that? Also, what about the issue of abortion? If anybody were ever tempted or in the position to consider abortion, it would have been Mary. Her life was on the line. Her social status was on the line. She had impossible expectations. She had an unplanned pregnancy, yet decided to go through with it, and we, have, we can experience salvation today because of it. Have you ever wondered how old Mary really was at the time that this took place? The Incredible Mysteries of the Bible says this, Young women typically were engaged after their first monthly period started and married about a year later. It also continues to say that if the culture then was the same as it is today, Mary could have been as young as 12 years old experiencing this. Can you imagine your 12-year-old daughter going through this? Now, now, I know what you're thinking. Why would God place such impossible expectations on Mary, on this young girl? Why would he put someone through this? But God did not put Mary through this without any sort of support. Not only was Mary having a miraculous experience, but so was her uh, relative Elizabeth. Luke 1.36 says, 
Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. Elizabeth was barren. There was no child. There was nothing on the way. But miraculously, at her old age, God chose to allow uh, the predecessor of Jesus to come through her. Why would he choose two relatives so close? Because they could be of support to each other. Mary could lean on the wisdom and experience of somebody else. God never brings us through something that's seemingly impossible without allowing us to have some sort of a support system also. God, who left all of heaven in perfection to come and be born through a seemingly illicit relationship, chose all of that because he knew it was the best way that he could possibly do it to save our lives. Genesis chapter 3.15, back in the Garden of Eden, sin came and Jesus already had the plan of salvation ready. And at this point, he enacted it. Genesis 3.15, the first prophecy in the Bible. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, this is God speaking to the devil, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The rescue plan was already there. Sin comes, it's put into action, and it is being fulfilled at the birth of of uh, through Jesus. Stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to see the prophetic significance and what it meant in the stars and to the scientists about a virgin birth. 6,000 years ago, God created a planet, Earth. There are now over 7 billion people on this planet. It is estimated that 2.7 billion of these people have never heard the gospel. It is our mission, our goal, to teach the world about the love of Jesus. It is our goal to help the world behold the Savior. Welcome back to Behold the Savior. We've seen the biblical and prophetic reasoning for a virgin birth, and we've seen that it does hold up to Bible study and scrutiny, despite what the critics say. Now let's see what it meant prophetically and in the stars to those that would have been watching for it. The Bible says in Psalm 19, verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. God would choose the things of the cosmos to explain and foretell the future to us. And I'm not talking about astrology. I am speaking of astronomy. Let's take a look back in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star, notice that's capital S, a star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter, a capital S, a scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. It was in prophecy that the Messiah would come and it would be relating to a star. Let's fast forward to the time of Christ, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And the wise men comes from the word magi, magicians. Why is it that heathens are coming from somewhere outside of Jerusalem looking for the Messiah, yet God's own people are not looking for him at this time? Matthew 2, 2. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? The magi ask. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. The Magi would have been astronomers. These were scientists that understood Bible prophecy waiting for the Messiah to be born. Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Since God uses the things of the universe to guide and direct us, again, not astrology, but astronomy, we find our answer, believe it or not, in the 12 signs of the zodiac. Originally, the 12 signs of the Zodiac were a reference to the 12 tribes of Israel. It did not have to do with fortune-telling, but it had to do with prophecy and guiding and directing God's people. The Desire of Ages puts it this way. By the way, the Desire of Ages 
is a beautiful book that chronicles the life of Christ. In fact, it was noted by the Library of Congress to be the most accurate book on the life of Christ outside the Bible, of course. And what it does is it harmonizes the Gospels, takes the four Gospels and puts them in, uh, in chronological order and helps us to understand it. If you have a chance, I highly recommend you get this book. In fact, if you contact me at BeholdTheSavior.com, I'll make sure you get a copy of this book. Wise men had seen a mysterious light in the heavens upon that night when the glory of God flooded the hills of Bethlehem. As the light faded, a luminous star appeared and lingered in the sky. What is this star? It was not a fixed star nor a planet, and the phenomenon excited the keenest interest. That star was a distant company of shining angels, but of this the wise men were ignorant. Yet they were impressed that the star was of special import to them. They consulted priests and philosophers and searched the scrolls of ancient records. Again, these wise men were new and were looking for a star at, a, at the right time, at the right place that they followed to find the Messiah. How in the world would they know these things? Our answer is found in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. Daniel was well acquainted, intimately acquainted, acquainted with specific prophecies in Daniel chapters 8 and 9 with specific unique things about the timing and events of the life of Christ. Daniel chapter 4 verse 9 says, Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar was the Babylonian name of Daniel. Belteshazzar, or Daniel, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dreams that I have seen and its interpretation. Belteshazzar, also known as Daniel, was chief of the magicians or magi or scientists. Many scholars wonder if he did not create a school or, or teach the things that he knew of God and science that passed down through the generations and that the wise men that came from the East were not carrying the knowledge that Daniel passed down looking for the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 3 says, The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Verse 6, the multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries, or camels, of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. Specific prophecies of wise men of influence that would come and present gifts to the boy Jesus. Bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold to honor his kingship frankincense to honor the priesthood of Jesus, and myrrh to honor his sacrifice. Now let's look to the book of Revelation to see how prophecies in the sky would relate to an understanding of Jesus. Revelation chapter 12 verse 1 says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. You might know that one of the 12 signs of the zodiac is, in fact, Virgo, or Virgin. And Jesus, speaking these prophecies, would have known that his people would have understood these things. In this instance, the woman represents the church. Jesus would come through the lineage of the church. Chapter 12, verse 2 says, Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. All along, even in the deepest of prophecies, we can have an understanding and see that it is Jesus that the Bible is pointing us to. It was Jesus in the Old Testament, it was Jesus in the Gospels, and it's Jesus in Revelation that God is trying to bring our attention to. Let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians regarding specific signs of Jesus' return. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Fascinating that it was through the symbolism and through the reality 
of a woman that Jesus came in flesh, God in flesh, the first time. The second time, the symbolism is a woman in, in birth pain that Jesus will come again. The next woman to give birth to the Messiah will be God's church. The next virgin to give birth will be God's church. When Jesus comes in the clouds and he takes the righteous up, it's his people that he's coming for. You can be one of his people. He's coming for anybody and everybody that will accept and follow him. Will you accept and follow him today? As we go through the Christmas season this time around, let's take our focus off of the gifts, off of the money, and put it back where it belongs on Jesus. Thank you, and Merry Christmas. Please like and share what you're learning on social media. Visit and like us on Facebook, visit and subscribe to the YouTube channel, and visit and subscribe to the website at BeholdTheSavior.com. Thank you, and God bless. I want to thank you for your constant encouragement, support, and prayers for Behold the Savior. This is a faith-based ministry, and we exist solely on the support of those that want to see the gospel taken to the world. 100% of the money that is donated to this ministry goes towards airtime and providing material for the gospel. Coming up on 96.3 FM, more uplifting music, but first a commercial. We have something for everyone at this church, located at 160 East Liberty Street, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. For children, we have Youth Night and Pathfinders. We even have something for toddlers and infants. For adults, we have several Bible study classes and community outreach programs. Come join us at 9 a.m. and 11. God wants to see you there. Hey, how about we go to church today? trying to keep me from church. It's only three blocks though and nothing is going to stop me. All week I work hard, I'm on the go non-stop, and it seems like I hardly have enough time to breathe. What I need is time to rest, a time to decompress. What I need is time with God. I need a place that will help me find peace and people that will accept me. I know this is that place. Hello, welcome to the Chambersburg Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're so glad to see you here. And I believe our pastor has a message just for you today. Thank you. You're welcome. Join us at 9 and 11 at 160 East Liberty Street at the Chambersburg Seventh-day Adventist Church. God might just have a message for you, too. And when you're here, you're family.